Hello, everyone, and um, welcome to, to the first session of Life Lessons. My name is Özge Ersoy, and I'm the, the Public Programs Lead at Asia Art Archive. Uh, and I'm very happy to have Pablo Higuera and Vidya Shivadas with us today. And before we start, um, I'd just like to, to say a couple of words about um, how, how Life Lessons, how the series um, came about. And for those of you who are less familiar with Asia Art Archive, we are an independent, not-for-profit arts organization based in Hong Kong. Uh, we have a library, we have archival collections, we do research, programming, and publishing uh, with a focus on recent art in Asia. And what we really try to do is to, to work on lesser known art histories in this region. Um, and so art pedagogy is part of this larger framework, and it's been one of our research priorities for a number of years, I would say for about a decade or so. And, uh, and in this period, what we've been trying to do is to, to trace influential art schools and also uh, self-organized initiatives and artist initiatives, educational initiatives, and study these places as um, communities or as uh, places of exchange, artistic lineages, but also somehow um, connectors between different art scenes across national boundaries in this region in Asia. So Life Lesson series, it really draws on um, this ongoing research that we've been doing and uh, for this series we are inviting individual artists to be in conversation with each other. Uh, these are artists and creative practitioners that we look up to, uh, people who have been dedicated to, to education and um, we'd like to, to ask them more about their personal stories and personal experiences with teaching. And I believe there is so much to learn from them, especially in these uh, trying times when we are all thinking about what community and care mean. Um, so I would like to, to give a brief introduction for our speakers. Uh, Pablo Helguera is an artist based in New York. Um, his artistic practice combines performance, community outreach and political activism. Uh, he's the author of numerous books. Uh, you might be familiar with the Education for Socially Engaged Art that he published around nine years ago. And Pablo has been also involved with um, education departments of established museums in the United States for, for decades. Uh, and since 2007, he's been the director of adult and education programs at the, the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And Vidya, uh, Vidya Shivadas, is a curator based in New Delhi. Um, she's the founding director of Thika, the, the foundation for Indian contemporary art. And Vidya's practice is committed to developing pedagogical models for young artists, curators, educators, and writers. Uh, so it's a, quite a big range that um, she's been working with. And she's also a visiting faculty at the, the School of Culture and Creative Expressions at Ambedkar University in Delhi. Uh, I want to add that this talk is organized as part of Asia Art Archive's Learning and Participation Program and it's supported by SHO Foundation Limited and CK and KHO Foundation. So I would like to extend our thanks uh, once again. And finally, for housekeeping, uh, this session will be for about an hour. We'll have a conversation and then we'll open the floor for questions and comments in the end. Um, so Pablo and Vidya, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Uh, I know it's uh, late afternoon in Delhi, but it's uh, 8 a.m. for Pablo in New York. So thank you so much for taking the time for this. And uh, perhaps I can start with our first question and ask you about the formation of your practice. And um, I'm wondering if you can tell us about one of the, the earlier classes or earlier learning experiences in school that you had and which, which, is, which is a class or a learning experience that had an impact on you, um, on the way that you think about education. And maybe, Pablo, we can start with you. Uh, thank you, Oscar. It's a pleasure to be here and to be in conversation again with, uh, with you guys. Uh, and yes, it's early in New York, but it's, it's nice. I'm, I'm a morning person, so I like it. Um, so the question of, uh, or early learning experiences. Um, <clears throat> the, the thing that I thought about when, when I first heard the question um, was uh, my, my art uh, college uh, experience. And the professor that I had who um, 
he passed away 12 years ago. His name was Robert Lesher at the School of the Institute of Chicago. <clears throat> um, I was coming from Mexico City, uh, wanting to be a muralist. I wanted to make like political art, you know, but of course I was thinking like 1930s political art, right? And, um, and, I, and I really encountered this completely different world uh, and that I was trying to, I, I was trying to understand contemporary art as, as a young artist. <clears throat> and, uh, and I had this art history class with this man who was, he looked like Orson Welles, this mountain of knowledge. And um, he was uh, an encyclopedic mind uh, and I would give these long art history talks. And his uh, classes were um, absolutely uh, enthralling because of his voice and the drama of the presentations of, of this, the many slides that he would show every single night or every single class. And um, <clears throat> uh, we actually became friends, he became a mentor and someone who was important to me. What I later learned or reflected upon those classes was the fact that for all the information that he was providing, what was really most uh, significant was the, um, the emotional and the, the, the weight of those stories that he was telling. He was truly a storyteller. And uh, when I think back on, on those experiences, I don't, I don't really remember a lot of the information of dates and uh, names and artists and movements, which, you know, of course, you as a student memorize, you know. But what's really most important is that emotional um, relationship that you have and that, 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 that really grounds you and, uh, and, and, and takes root in your experience and becomes something that you pursue for the rest of your life. And when I look back about my, er my earliest childhood experiences in, 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 uh, in learning, um, my grandmother, uh, when I was 12 or 13, she took me to, to uh, Guadalajara, in, which is a city in Mexico that has you know, some of the most famous murals by Jose Clemente Orozco. And that's when I decided I was going to be an artist. But if you really think back about these, um, question and you ask everybody like what is your first experience or positive experience with art almost always it's social it's always this social relationship and um whether your parents or somebody you care about took you to see something or you were with somebody that that that, that was special to you uh, that becomes part of a conversation and uh, and I believe that uh, that is really a, an intricate aspect of, of, of what art is. It's, it's a community. It's it's a dialogue. It's communication. It's experiences together. Um, so that's what always has stayed in my mind. How the importance of of the experiential the nature of the art of the experience and, and what what's in what's inherently a, a learning experience from all that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And did you did you also have a similar experience? Was there a particular person? in your life um, when you were at school or someone from your family that was influential? Yeah. No, I was just thinking back about uh, education and thinking, of course, about many kind and committed teachers who I remember with a lot of gratitude. But I think the most transformative experience of education for me was the environment of the art college itself. Um, and I remember going there from having studied at Delhi University and being part of a liberal arts uh, sociology program. Um, and going to this school in the late 90s, which was quite small in scale, where you know there were 400 students across undergrad and postgrad programs, and uh, meeting people who came from very different backgrounds, social, economic, caste, and cultural backgrounds, and um, and the city itself, Baroda itself, was a very small and immersive city. So there was this way that you know time kind of opened up, and we had these long. Uh, experience of uh, hours together at the faculty. And I really sensed, I mean, I, and I'm not a practitioner in that sense, but I could feel that there was this meeting ground in practice, uh, which didn't, of course, erase all differences, but it allowed people to be together in a process and uh, created a kind of sense of acceptance and camaraderie. Um, and I was just thinking back about the history of art schools uh, like Baroda and Shantiniketan and how this sense of instilling a community is quite important in the making of these schools. Uh, last year, I was attending a conference by uh, Gulam Sheikh, and he was talking about the 50s when the school was when the school came up, and he was one of the earlier batches. And uh, he was talking about how, you know, of course, the school was dreaming and imagining the contours of uh, dreaming big and thinking about the contours of a post-independence art education uh, program, but also working in 
in a small scale, almost Gandhian in its approach, where the teacher-student ratio was quite small. And uh, given that Baroda had this kind of special thrust towards art history and uh, you know, thinking about pra practice in both its critical and creative aspects, Gulam Bai was sharing how teachers would, all teachers would take art history courses and would be often found studying in libraries and uh, so there was this kind of space of co-learning and collective inquiry um, and working together on, on forums like the, the, um, the annual fine art fairs. And, um, and of course, I mean, when I went in the late 90s, that original zeal had somewhat worn off, but there was this spirit. And, um, and the other thing that I also I found interesting, and I think it was also for me to just be in an environment of makers and uh, was this kind of self-sufficiency and this quest for quality that people pursued. And of course it was about skill and it was about technical progress and it was about the formalist, uh, you know, sort of mastery. But it was also about setting certain kinds of internal benchmarks. And uh, the references for this didn't just come from the modern artist genius paradigm. Um, the artists were in conversation with many kinds of makers, whether they were folk artists, craftsmen, fabricators, workers. And it wasn't just about this kind of romanticized notion of art making, but it was about labor and resilience, about receptivity to materials, working imaginatively and um, with available resources. And the school had this potential to be a space where all these multiple experiences and inheritances uh, could be engaged in all their political and material implications. Uh, I'm not saying that it happened all the time and it, more often than not it doesn't, but the student body really did represent that potential and even now when we go to art schools we feel, we can see that, you know. We saw this, we've seen this articulation in a forum like the Students Biennale, uh, where, which is like a, you know, Biennale platform which I'll just talk about maybe briefly later but where uh, students form collectives to explore their own histories and thinking about questions of caste, family, labor process. And they were also very critical about how these self formations were not maybe always expressed or addressed in curriculums. So I don't know, somehow that, that whole experience of the uh, community based on this kind of care and relationships that were forming and uh, which was also able to somewhere respectfully and powerfully engage with differences and allow these different formations and subjectivities to express themselves. That is something I really carry with me and and I always think about how one could place it at the center of an institutional vision. I mean I think it would be great if we can speak more about how storytelling, hard self, the idea of self-sufficiency or community building factor in, in your experience, uh, in your practice, and also in your experience with institutions. So maybe it's a follow-up question that I can continue with, um, because both of you, you work with different types of institutions uh, in your practice, and some of them, we might consider them as these more permanent institutions, permanent structures, such as museums or, let's say, universities, and some of them are more characterized as temporary, I would say, such as biennials. So I'm curious how you move within these structures and Mida maybe, Mida maybe we can continue with you because you were speaking about the students biennale because when I have that question in mind, um, of course I, I think about your ongoing activities at FICA, but um, you are also dedicated to develop these educational programs for temporary structures and stu students biennale in Kochi is one of them. So maybe we can start with you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, just to preface that, I was just thinking about, of course, you know, some work that I've done as an educator, but uh, just being more invested also in building institutional structures that can absorb work. So the work of various educators and resource people who are also channeling contemporary art practices uh, towards education. And, um, you know, this whole question of how do we think via institutions or how do we think about institutions uh, which Paul O'Neill and Mick Wilson and their book constitutions think, you know, raise these crucial questions which I'm quite interested in. And uh, the, the institutional landscape and that's, you know, when I was talking about Baroda, I was also thinking about the institutional landscape of 
in South Asia, which is quite different from the Euro American context, where uh, you know in the 20th century you see a contrast between few uh, state institutions and a large number of uh, initiatives that are led by artists in the setting of societies or uh, schools or publications, etc. So, um, and uh, here there are efforts to build and engage and expand the scope of institutions and even the contentious debates and failures that many times occur can be understood as part of this dialogue. Uh, and of course the tragedy is that very little of this gets documented and uh, now there are more, there's more scholarship in this area and Ishaat Archive of course is doing amazing work. Um, I was just thinking back about um, listening to um, this Bangladeshi photographer and artist Munim Basif uh, in 2017 in Dhaka and uh, he was just talking about Chobi Mela which is an important photography festival uh, started in the, in 2000 and uh, you know this this we were, and it, it had a history of about 17 years and it predates a lot of the photo festivals uh, that are taking place now in, in India and Kathmandu and various parts of uh, South Asia. Um, and he was talking about it in very tentative terms about, you know, whether there would be another edition and talking about the precarity of funding or the issues of censorship uh, and the political pressures on close associates like Shahidul Alam, who was very closely associated with Chobi Melan, was arrested in 2018. So this whole idea of building on slippery ground, which seems to be part of the condition here. And uh, and I think now with maybe with COVID, we're also seeing this kind of precarity emerging in a lot of Western institutions as well. And, you know, the reading about how educational institutions and, and museums are going through some amount of crisis in the West as well. But uh, so really thinking about the fact that okay so we have a more recent development of institutions in the past 15 years and uh, a more a kind of infrastructure that's building around now private museums or biennales festivals uh, non-profits and then the question comes up about how do we create synergies so we can work together and not in isolated pockets and also thinking about how we can spread resources in a country like india which is where resources are not even and uh, you know, thinking about the conversations that can happen. So the Students Biennale becomes a really um, like productive case study in this um, in this kind of uh, formulation where uh, this was a Biennale which was proposed by the Kochi Muzuris uh, Kochi Biennale Foundation in 2014 and uh, Pika worked with it, uh, has been working with it since the first edition. And uh, it's it's really thinking about this kind of you know energetic global Biennale platform and trying to think about how it could link up to questions of education uh, and how it could include um, various kinds of practitioners, um, educators, art schools in different parts of the country into the conversation. And um, so we it's been a very kind of uh, proliferating and dispersed kind of uh, uh, platform where, uh, you know, we worked with young curators and provided them with some kind of basic training uh, or working training to actually go out into the schools and to develop frameworks uh, to bring these practices to Kochi. And, uh, and, uh, and there have been three editions and of course each edition has sort of improvised and developed new ways to actually respond because it's in terms of scale, it's it's a huge um, uh, project, and you know we've been covering more than we covered 37 schools, and then more than 50 schools in the subsequent uh, 2014 and uh, 2016 and 2018 editions. So really involving uh, many, many, many kinds of uh, people and institutions, and trying to create uh, a space where they can all participate and. Uh, and would you say so that? I think, oh, sorry, you go ahead. No, no, no. So I think that's been one one way that sort of we've been thinking about also working between institutions and also trying to think about other models that emerge from a Biennale, which then lends itself towards um, an educational platform and then goes back into an exhibition. So, yeah. 
And would you say that your urgencies on the, the methods that you're using for these mm -hmm. classrooms, they would be very different from the ones that you use at FICA? Uh, yeah, because I think, I mean, in FICA, I think, I mean, we, we are also working, uh, we're quite, in a, we work in a small scale and the idea is also that we're, uh, you know, experimenting with some uh, educational modules. We're trying to think of ways to bring uh, different kinds of uh, educators and uh, young practitioners and trying to think of this, the, the gaps that are there between the debris practice and pedagogy. But uh, with the Biennale, I think we're dealing with a very large scale. Um, and so then of course we have to, and we're also dealing with something that has a sense of an output in terms of uh, an exhibition, a biennale, or uh, so. I think the, the way that we work with the two would be slightly different, uh, but yeah, I think they've also informed us because I think the more, more we work with the biennale, we've also been uh, sort of uh, developing our programs for young practitioners. For example, you know, the focus on young practitioners became much stronger since we started working on the biennale platform and. Uh, so moving between large scale and small scale, I think, uh, and playing with the both the flexibility and the possibility of both forums. I guess one of the words that you use when you speak about these intensive courses that are temporary was fugitive methodologies, but maybe it's something that we can delve into later. Mm -hmm. um, Pablo, I want to ask you the, the same questions, these permanent structures versus more temporary ones. Because, uh, of course, you lead the, the educational programs at the MoMA, but you also create temporary institutions. And um, I'm not sure if you would call the School of Pan-American Unrest as an institution, for instance, but that would be a question that I would have for you. Um, what would you say? Yeah, so, um, yes, I've worked in museums for many, many years. And, um, and of course, the, the, the type of interaction and, and projects that you can develop within with a museum that it's like a fixed a physical typical fixed institution within a community is very different from what you can do when you are a foreigner in a different place that is a community that is not yours necessarily <clears throat> and um i think the the difference is of course that the museum um has a long-term uh, mission you know which is uh, in committing to to many communities, but most importantly, to the community that's most immediate to it, uh, which is the people who live there. Uh, and uh, people who maybe um, uh, because of where they live or because of what they do are connected to that institution. So uh, I think an institution is successful in as much as it responds to that commitment and, uh, and it fulfills the responsibility of engaging those uh, different communities in a dialogue. Of course, when you are an artist traveling uh, in different places or when you work in a biennial, um, th these, these changes, right? You, you become, a, a, as I said, you know, a, this external um, visitor uh, to this local reality. And, and I think it's very important to recognize that this role that you, that you, that, that you are playing in this, in this interaction cannot be hidden. You know, it's 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 a fact that you are not from there, that you are not that that you are an instigator or a guest in the best of circumstances in this particular context. That uh, you know, individuals know best and better than you. I have a lived it and experienced it directly. So I think that it's very important to to recognize that in a in a sense these individuals have the the local knowledge and uh, and. Uh, I think the, the, the role, I think, of the artist or the curator in those circumstances is to try to recognize that as well, you know, and then give them like a forum where these individuals can, can, can express those, those uh, the, the share that knowledge that they have. <clears throat> and uh, the School of Pan American Unrest was a project of that nature where I, I basically visited uh, 27 different cities in the, in the Americas, driving from Alaska to Chile, asking uh, individuals what were the challenges that they were confronting at any given moment, at that moment in their lives, as uh, citizens and as residents of that particular city where I was, whether it was in Anchorage, Alaska, or in Santiago de Chile, or in Managua, in Nicaragua, it didn't matter. Um, the effort there was to provide a, uh, a platform of discussion 
uh, where they were the experts, not me. I was simply a moderator, a, uh, a facilitator of a discussion. But at the same time, I was the one who was the instigator and the one who had structured that particular um, space for them. Um, so to me, it, it's always, and this also goes back to the subject of uh, socially engaged art. You know, like to me, that type of practice is a lot about constructing um, scaffolding and, uh, and, and structures within which these types of interactions can occur in a successful manner and in a meaningful manner. It's not simply playing lip service to participation and saying like, well, say whatever you want and nobody cares what, nobody's going to be there to listen and to be affected by what is being said, but, but uh, creating something that really will be meaningful. I want to mention um, a, um, another example of a project that I that I was involved in, uh, I was very um, honored to be part of, which was the Mercosul Biennial in Brazil, which was uh, led by Jose Roca. He's a Colombian curator and uh, put together a, a team of, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, individuals, curators, artists to, to put this uh, project together. I was the pedagogical curator of that biennial. Uh, that was back in 2011. And uh, one thing that we um, also recognized when we were there was that uh, there were many artists in the city of Porto Alegre where the biennial takes place that felt very kind of left out because it's an international exhibition and international exhibitions typically just bring artists from all over the world that are like renowned artists and typically does not directly engage with the local art scene. So they felt like that was not for them. They wanted to do their own biennial and so forth. So what we decided to do was to rent a house uh, that we called Casa M. It was essentially a, we used some of the money of the biennial to rent this house. Uh, there was a, actually a very beautiful house with a garden in the back and it, it was kind of like a, a narrow house. And we kind of turned it into a residency space that was open completely to all the local artists. And we also programmed it. Um, we created a structure of programs that were like every every week there was like an artist talk and there was like a conversation and a performance and and, uh, and a workshop and so essentially it became the means by which the uh, biennial completely integrated into the community and where artists who were coming uh, to do research or, or pre prepare projects for the biennial would also stay there and uh, share their work with the local artists and your local artists will share work with them. And uh, so by the time the biennial opened, uh, it felt that the, the, all the, the, we had created a community of all the participating artists with all the local artists. And it became kind of a very beautiful integration of local and external knowledge, which I think it's what we, in a way, are trying to aim for when we produce projects uh, that are temporary, uh, that, that are not like, uh, rooted in one particular place, but that are, that are uh, always transferred into new locations. So anyway, those, those are some of the things that I, that I also learned from those experiences. I mean, it's quite interesting to, to think about these different positions, the, the guest and the host. And I guess it's something that we also think about, you know, it's an organization like AAA because we are most of the time, we are considered to be the host and then the, the users would be the, the guest of the organization. And we are very much interested in how, how these positions might shift over time, you know, what is the, the point when the users themselves or the participants in the projects that you're talking about, what is the moment when they take the ownership of the project? I think that's a really interesting shift and something that is uh, not that easy to create the conditions of. Um, but one thing that I also want to ask you, Pablo, um, I believe this was uh, in an interview before, but I remember you saying that um, there is no need to, to negate institutions as artists and artists need to build institutions. We need to be institutional. Um, and I believe this was a couple of years ago and I just want to ask if this is a statement that you are still defending. <laughs> so um, I, uh, well, I, I, I guess I came of age or artistic age uh, <laughs> in the era of institutional critique. You know, I mean, I was, and, I, and I'm still, uh, influenced and and, um, and admire the work of many artists that are typically associated with the subject of institutional critique. Um, what was uh, to me difficult to, um, I guess, to to negotiate for myself was the fact that I was also working in a museum and, and then I was interested in work that that is against the institution. 
And then uh, at some point I was like asking myself, like, well, I, I'm the institution, right? Because I work in the institution. So if I hate the institution, then I hate myself. <laughs> or like, what's the, I mean, it, it becomes like a very kind of like uh, identity crisis type of moment. Uh, and, um, and I really wanted to understand what, when you go at the bottom of institutional critique, what it's really about. And uh, I, what I really felt was that what, uh, basically what, uh, what, what Mr. Fuller once said, you know, instead of uh, critiquing a system, you need to create a new system that makes the previous system irrelevant, you know? And, and I feel that as artists, you know, uh, the best critique of an institution is to build an institution yourself, you know? Um, of course, I'm not a funder or a billionaire that can create a museum of my own, but we as artists, we're inventors, and we're inventors of models, and we can create models that can be scalable. You know, so what? That's what I started to do. I started to do projects that that were research projects and that received institutional names. My first project of that nature was called Instituto de la Telenovela, which was uh, essentially a research institute about the impact of Latin American soap operas in the rest of the world. Uh, I noticed that that uh, Mexican soaps were being seen in places like Israel and all over Russia, and they were like incredibly popular because they told fables or stories that completely impacted people from completely different parts of the world. So I did a project that was really a research project about that. That, that could have become perhaps an institution, but it was an artist created institution uh, that they tried to have the rigor and, uh, and the discipline of like a true research organization with public programs and events and publications and such. So, um, so I mean, so my, my spirit at that, at that moment uh, was that Yes, um, the best way to to critique or reimagine the institution is to also become institutional yourself, but not institutional in that uh, political sense, but institutional in the way that we can imagine those new realities for others um, to um, to format and and uh, and, uh, and transform. And this other project that I could talk about, but that's that's essentially the the. Then in a nutshell, what that is. And I think it's a, it's a nice segue to perhaps discuss a little bit more about the idea of authorship, because some of the um, educational projects, let's say, they are defined, uh, sometimes they are defined as artworks or they are defined as curatorial projects uh, where um, you have a very particular position of authorship. This is your project. And some educational projects are presented as I would say, as, as tools that you would use with an institution. Um, and this position would become a little bit blurry uh, in a way. And I'm wondering for both of you, uh, what do you think about the, the potential of claiming or disclaiming this particular position and what could be the limitations of doing so as well? And maybe Vidya, um, I'll ask first. No, I was just thinking about this question of authorship and it's a tricky terrain and on one hand of course you know we want to break out of this emphasis on individual individuated ownership or this emphasis on great artists uh, but there's also another kind of long-standing practice of invisibility of many people and appropriation of people's skills and labor and within a system that needs to be connected and uh, so just thinking about this whole act of naming designating about sharing responsibility creating the right frames from, you know, when we're inviting someone to participate. Um, and, you know, we don't ever do anything alone, but we also need to think about what this nature of this collaboration is and how does it get recorded in public and in an ethical and inclusive manner. So, um, so for example, one of the things that we are interested in is looking at art education as a practice. And this is something that, uh, you know, hasn't, hasn't had the same kind of recording in, in the Indian context. Uh, many Indian artists have, uh, and, and even in South Asia, many artists have and continue to be committed teachers. And yet there's very little written or shared about this aspect of their practice. And if you think of the number of experiments that have been undertaken in classrooms from which, you know, um, collective uh, practices emerged, um, they don't really form part of the narrative. And of course, these histories of educators do not need to be written in the same hagiographic manner that we would write about individual artists. Um, 
so the expanded so this year actually at the students bennale uh, so the past the 2014 and the 2016 edition was about working with uh, curators and about training young curators to go and uh, work with young artists but uh, this uh, the 2018 edition we also created something called the expanded education program which uh, was really focused on thinking about uh, what educators are doing and uh, we did this through a series of workshops uh, for students at different colleges and centers uh, that mobilized you know ideas around technology uh, materiality city and site and it was also about paying attention to educators strategies and experiments and uh, we, we documented these with uh, some modules that they had shared and interviews by them, which we put together in a publication, thinking about their methods, thinking about their uh, formations and what they had learned in these years of teaching. Um, and I just wanted to show that image, if it's possible. I mean, it's, it's just a, um, sure, an image of uh, four workshops. Sure, um, share the screen. Just one second, please. So, for example, one of the things that uh, we, we, we really discussed in the workshops was also trying to think about the city as a site, you know, and uh, opening this up for art students. Of course, uh, the city is a visual stimulus and there are many kinds of uh, uh, engagements that art students have with their uh, you know, drawing and uh, working on site and things like that. But we really sort of thought about um, I hope uh, making them think about this differently. So uh, in Mumbai, um, Kaushik Mukhopadhyay and Sonal Sundarajan, uh, who are both, um, Kaushik is an artist, but he's also um, an educator uh, who teaches in a, and both of them teach in an architecture school. And they really asked the students from JJ school to reconsider how they would study, uh, they would study the city, how they would look at uh, architecture, how people inhabited it, navigated through it, um, thinking about how one could work through its material accumulations. Um, in Chennai, uh, the first picture on the top, uh, where it, it was a very different kind of workshop, which was taken by uh, a Sri Lankan artist and educator, Sanatana. And uh, here he explored the city through, uh, he explored the city of Chennai through a series of memory walks uh, with different researchers and activists. and thinking of the city as a kind of contested archive and, uh, you know, a city that is written through layers of experiences of caste, ecological issues, gender, various ways of reading the city or uh, through the history of film, for example, um, and just sort of opening that up for them. Uh, in Delhi, um, we had a, a South African educator and artist, Rangauto Lasane, and uh, he was really exploring the city and um, the site around the Ambedkar University and the, the, the workshop was held there as a kind of constant negotiating and a shifting definition of the self in relation to others and also using you know like these kind of sonic uh, the sonic as a site of experimentation and finally in Guwahati um, where the workshop was taken by Amriganka Madhulaitya who's an artist and uh, also teaches at the IIT in Guwahati where he was actually interested in creating a forum where students and practitioners uh, were invited to think together about what would be a critical pedagogy for the for the site of Assam uh, and really thinking about you know the northeast and Assam sort of uh, uh, needing maybe different kinds of uh, frameworks and also inviting different kinds of uh, practitioners to speak and uh, from different disciplines as well. So in some cases, these processes were very unexpected for the students. At other times, it, they were antagonistic to their understanding. At still other times, they were, they were very participatory or uh, giving them methods to explore what they were already engaging with. And so there were very vastly different kinds of uh, uh, methods and uh, modalities with which sort of the uh, artists, uh, the educators sort of help them think through or break out of a certain way of like exploring the city, I think, uh, as a site. Um, so yeah, I think, and, and the other question also then becomes about, um, you know, how 
how does the role of the institution also get um, registered and recorded? And uh, this is not only to just produce a kind of um, sort of uh, to build a kind of a account of uh, you know the the greatness of an institution, but to also sort of uh, uh, sort of register something on in us in a, on a site, and so like, I mean, if you look at uh, the decade of grants that say FICA gives in public art projects, you see a way that that this institution is shaping uh, that field, and it's not presenting itself as a kind of neutral process. So the curatorial is one strategy, of course, which uh, has a performative aspect. And uh, over the past year, few years, we've been doing lots of exhibitions. Um, and one of the things that we are interested in is um, thinking about um, uh, the reading room, which we've been interested in as a site of curatorial and artistic, uh, like a, a curatorial and artistic composition. Um, so yeah. Pardo, may I ask the, the same question to you? Um, about how do you negotiate these positions and when are you, when do you feel more ready to give it up? Um, or is it a you. very tired question? Maybe we can also put it like that. Uh, no, I think it's, I think it's an important question uh, to me. Um, and I would say that uh, working in a museum, um, of course the authors are the artists that are on view. And my position in the museum as a facilitator and creator of experiences is essentially about being invisible to the public. So like I don't, I don't. It, and museums are a great, great. Working in a museum is a great antidote for your desire for uh, protagonism, <laughs> um, and it's also a wonderful way, I think, um, as an artist, to learn how to collaborate with others and how to like think of ideas with others. This is not to mean, of course, that you are not accountable for the things that happen, that, that bad things that might happen, but you, you, do, you do get internal credit and, and, uh, and also you are accountable for things that go, go wrong. Um, but um, it's a way of um, working, working in that context, it really forces you to, to really acknowledge that, um, that it's really not about authorship it's, uh, or I mean, you, you, the work that you do is 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 uh, is works best when your people are not thinking about about you. <laughs> it's kind of like uh, what what maybe the curator Paul Herkenhoff has said. You know, being a great curator means that nobody's actually seeing your work, but because it feels very seamless. You know, um, that shifts completely when you are an artist, right? Because uh, as an artist, you are the the the, the point person or the, the, the focus of, uh, of the project. And, um, and to, to claim that you are not the author or that you are kind of like letting people do what, what they want, it's, it's in a way um, misleading because you indeed, indeed are the artist and you are meant to be the instigator, the facilitator, the person who creates the structure and ultimately the person who is accountable for whatever is happening. So those are, those are the important things to, um, to think about in terms of in terms of authorship, so I I, I do believe that um, that um, the elimination of authorship um, is not productive when, when when you're also eliminating accountability, and uh, and and well, the way I, I tend to think about this issue um, also as through my work is also in terms of methodology, um, uh, and again it comes from education. Like you you create um, a structure. Or, or, or a, a, a series of scripts or patterns or, um, or models that others can utilize. Um, and maybe we, if you have a moment, I mean, can we go to the slide of the Libreria Don Celis for a second? So I can talk a, a little bit about how that, that functions. If we can share um, screen, that would be great. One second, please. So th th this project that I started in 2013 um, it's a it's a used bookstore that uh, travels through the United States. Um, it's 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 used books in Spanish to recognize the number one the fact that um, used bookstores are disappearing in the in the United States around the world, you know, and uh, because of the emergence of the ebook, um, but also the fact that in many communities in the United States they have a majority or many Latino Latino. Um, immigrants and uh, people of Latino descent, 
uh, Latin American descent, there's a very few or no Spanish books available. So uh, this project became a space where people can um, can buy books uh, or in a, in a pay what you wish basis. All the proceeds go to local community to the local communities where it is, and we do programs uh, on a regular basis. Um, the bookstore has to travel now to 13 different um, uh, cities in the U.S. and still continues. So it was a project that I thought I would just uh, run for a year, for a month or two, and it's been now uh, seven years, uh, which is really been very gratifying. Um, and um, again, uh, speaking of um, methodologies and models that I was referencing before. It, this is a very simple model. It's the people donate books. We bring them from Latin America. Um, they are accessible for all, for all, everybody, and it's really a social experience. You know, you you come together. Uh, we do these events called tertulias, which are kind of like uh, soirees events where there's conversations, there's music, there's reading, there's like a book club or whatever. You know, um, something that was really to me very gratifying from this project was when we were in Phoenix in Arizona. Um, <clears throat> a group of local artists um, came to me and said, like, we would love to do this bookstore ourselves. And they knew that the bookstore would not stay there forever because, you know, we can only keep them for a few months in each city. Um, so they decided to create their own uh, bookstore. And there's a bookstore in Phoenix called now Palabras, where that is essentially the model of the Don Celes bookstore that I'm, I'm very thankful that it was created. Um, <clears throat> and there's just an example of how what we are, what we create uh, as artists, as curators, or as cultural workers, um, uh, it's not so much about authorship. It's about forms of of making. It's it's about models and uh, and and, um, and replicable um, 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 I don't know, initiatives that that can be really taken and adapted and reinterpreted and transformed by others. And that that is really what I think it, it, it's all about. Mm -hmm. uh, what you're talking about actually reminded me of an artist friend of mine um, who started a school a number of years ago and the, the school is temporarily hosted by a number of art institutions and he was saying that when he actually think about when he actually thinks about the structure of the school and the the participants the the position of authorship is not something that he is very comfortable with but it when it comes to making the, the school possible or sustainable, let's say for six years, for eight years, it's actually important that sometimes you claim that position. Um, and I was thinking a similar question for Libreria uh, um, Donceles as well. For, for instance, do you think that it's a project that got realized uh, even more or that basically that was enabled because of your position as an artist too? Um, well, in fact, I think the only reason why this bookstore can possibly exist is because it's an art project. Um, I mean, as a business, it's a terrible model because <laughs> we, we just we just don't make any money or, or we or the money that we make, we donate it. I mean, what I'm what I'm really doing is I'm asking for the support of our organizations to host or to sponsor this 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 project in different locations in the in the in the, in, the, in a AE city mm -hmm. and. Um, and I'm very thankful that these other artists started that, that project, but it really does become a nonprofit project. It, it, it's you're not building Ama, like an Amazon kind of organization, you know. It's it's an it, that's really not the goal. It's it's really to 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 run um, an, uh, a project that that can really serve the community and uh, and it can give back to the community. So at least that's what. Mm -hmm. we'll see. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, I'm just aware of time. We have 10 minutes left. Um, so we, maybe we can move to, to the questions. And we have two questions for the moment. If that's fine with you, Vidya and Pablo, I'll just yeah, yeah. Uh, them up that for you. Is that fine? OK. Yeah. Uh, the first question is from Amrita Gupta Singh and uh, asking um, about the, the current context of the pandemic. How do we rethink about the, the public, publics and experiential methodologies when placing ourselves in public spaces um, is about distancing of many kinds. So how do we see us um, shaping our work with communities and with people where sociality exchange, working together, participation in adjacent ways is central? 
And the last um, sentence is, uh, and COVID-19 displaces all these forms and at least for some time where conversations are moving online. So I would be curious how you would respond to that. Yeah, no, I mean, it's something I've been feeling very sad about also, and you know, like uh, losing touch with a lot of people. I know that sort of, especially young practitioners have been moving back home and, you know, one is, one is uh, also used to being more in contact and, and the kind of formats that we are working with definitely, it's not like um, everyone has, uh, and also there've been so many discussions online about, and surveys that are happening because the, Indian government is also pushing for digital education, online education, and uh, you know, and the surveys are showing like uh, surveys that University of Hyderabad is undertaking or Delhi University, the various schools because they are being uh, asked to conduct online exams and things like that. Uh, that you really realize that there's such a broken infrastructure uh, in, across the country and uh, people don't have access to internet, they don't have access to electricity, so given all these situations, this kind of, like, I mean, digital, the online does make some conversations possible, but many people are excluded from it. And uh, that's something that I'm, I've been thinking about. And But one of the nice things that sort of actually started, uh, it, was an, it's a, it was a project that we started uh, with our uh, students at the Ambedkar University as part of the curatorial program where uh, uh, this was a project initiated by Rangato from Johannesburg. And it was a letter exchanging program between his students and uh, students in Guangzhou, Virginia, and Delhi. And uh, it was really thinking about the technologies of letter writing, um, about thinking about the, the quality of time and the form and the address, all of these aspects that are integral to letter, uh, to the letter. Uh, and. Uh, and then the because of the epidemic, sort of the whole the project kind of de detoured, and uh, what has now emerged is uh, that uh, especially the, for the students of the Ambedkar University, they've taken uh, the letters kind of became about conversations among themselves as well uh, because they suddenly lost contact with each other uh, with the batchmates itself, and uh, so then uh, and and now we're trying to think about ways that we could sort of um continue online and we've been having some conversations with the students in Johannesburg and it's a very particular uh you know the, the letter is a very vulnerable and personal and uh, emotional space as well and uh, where you could talk about uh, something individual but also which would open up so maybe we find other forms and uh, it's something that we need to work through this present moment Pablo, I'm also thinking about your telegrams project, you know, speaking about COVID-19 and how the conversations are moving online. Um, yeah, and well, first I want to say, yes, I, I completely agree with Vidya. We, we have to find other ways. Uh, and yes, I mean, we are, uh, many of us are in, in some way in a, in a privileged situation that we can connect online, that we can, that we, we have these other methods of, of connecting. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a very challenging moment for us where we need to reimagine or rethink what communication can be and should be in order to move forward. Um, myself, in my particular situation, um, I am, you know, in lockdown in Brooklyn. You know, um, I had COVID-19 uh, a few months ago. Um, and um, when I, I was thankfully able to recover, uh, and uh, shortly around that time, um, a, a curator friend of mine started a conversation with me about what we could do for people who are isolated or in lockdown. And I remember that I had done this project years ago um, uh, about using singing, the singing telegram format. It was a format that was invented uh, during the Great Depression uh, in the United States to, um, to cheer people up, you know, over the phone. You know, instead of like delivering a physical letter or uh, telegram, you would actually call somebody on the, on the telephone and then sing the message to the person. Uh, we thought that we would try it in Zoom and, um, and it has become a quite uh, beautiful and meaningful experience. Like I dress in my Telegram delivery outfit and then I sing songs to people all over the world for free, you know? And uh, these, are, these become very um, uh, 
spontaneous interactions, or I mean, they're scheduled, of course, you know, like somebody deliver, sends a message uh, and I have to deliver the message and, and, and sing a song, which can be opera or like a Mexican folk a song or Hollywood uh, music tune or Broadway or whatever, you know, to the person. And, um, and it's a very small way to create an emotion, to, to serve as the bridge of an emotional connection between two partners, between somebody's son or somebody's daughter, uh, somebody's grandmother. I was very busy during Mother's Day delivering a lot of <laughs> messages to, to moms all over the world, uh, as places as, uh, you know, that, that, that are from like uh, New Zealand to Singapore to Italy to like all over Latin America to uh, wh you name it, you know. Um, but I mean, I think it, it all comes down to really the question of like, what can we do within our resources um, and our, our abilities to, to communicate with others? You know, and uh, we can look back at history of how that was done. You know, it was, it was not, I mean, it was done through letters. It was done through very simple gestures that um, perhaps for, for we have become unaware of how meaningful those things can be. But receiving a physical letter um, from somebody is, is a really powerful thing that you can still do. And um, so this, this, I think this entire COVID um, period has really made us rethink our relationship to time our relationship to the immediacy of communication and and has helped us uh, maybe value small things in ways that we had never thought about before. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. uh, we have two more questions. I think I will combine them. The, the first one is from Michelle Wong. And Michelle is asking, were there moments when you think the school model was a complete failure? Um, that's the first question. And I believe Sabih's question is a, is a follow-up question to, to that. Um, he's, um, he's speaking about the, the idea of building new models um, and, or make um, you know, existing models, you know, that the, the new models that make the existing models obsolete or irrelevant. And uh, he's saying that in many cases, the problem is not necessarily that the models are outdated, but rather even problematic and damaging. So he's asking, is the space of art to change them from within or do we create models elsewhere? So first a school question and where do we create other models? So that's the second question. Vidya, would you like to take it? So what was the school question, sorry? Were there any moments when you think that the school model was a complete failure? The what school? Because the, the school model itself the was a complete model, failure. Okay. Was, were there sure. any moments? Because in your in your talk, you spoke about the, the art school as this empow empowering structure with yeah, the yeah. community and then the... Um, oh, of course. I mean, you, yeah. Yeah. no, I was not setting it up as a... Uh, I was setting up some qualities of it, which I found powerful. But there were uh, a lot of things, I mean, and these are things that come up when we meet young students today also that, uh, you know, that uh, uh, that I think they've become extremely provincial in some ways and uh, there is a lot of uh, like you know not really linking creating enough linkages with the world outside for the students when there is a sense of maybe you're building a community within but you don't know how to broker that relationship with the with the world outside and I think that's something that uh, and especially given the way that creative labor is valued and uh, I think there needs to be more, you know, processes of empowerment. So there are many things that are not working in that system. Uh, and, uh, but yeah, so, and uh, maybe Pablo can answer this one. Um, so in, in this book that I wrote, um, a number of years ago, the Education for Social Language Start, I, what I was trying to do there was to, to show how uh, different educational methods, methodologies, approaches can be utilized for the artistic process of socially engaged art to, um, to generate conversation, to create models of collaboration, to models of um, evaluation and documentation. Like all these things are part of the of pedagogical processes. 
uh, that can be incorporated at an employer. What I what I did not do in the book, or I did not really want to deal with, is to, um, to 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 deploy a critique of our projects that are that are what I um, will term today pretend play. It's an early childhood education term for like you know you you pretend that you are in the supermarket and you're like buying things and you're or, or you have a baby and or you're playing with a doll and you pretend that you're you're a mom i mean these are ways in which we um psych children psychologically try to like uh, 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 assimilate uh, behaviors and roles um but uh what we what we do when we actually are employing educational models uh, just to employ the education model to like follow them the mechanism of those models, it's pretend play of education where it's not really changing anything. We're doing it more for ourselves and for publicity than to actually change anything. What we really need to do is to, to employ those, those tools and those, um, uh, those methods to really um, use them the way they should be used, you know, to really have a conversation, and which really means uh, to have an, an empathic, pathetic relationship with, with, a, with, with another person and to, to use what we have listened to to move ahead to another to another stage. Um, so um, I think in education uh, to me is a failure uh, in as much as it remains simply a uh, pretend play or, or like or simply it's done just to, to to be able to say that you have a school or that you are like doing this educational pedagogical project. The question really is like what what is it exactly that you are doing? What it's what is it what it's his goals? What it's what is what is it accomplishing and how can you critically evaluate it so that it actually is meeting the goals that you set them to, to meet in the first place. Thank you so much, both of you. Uh, we have two more questions from Emily and Liana, but I'm afraid we are running out of time. But uh, so we will save your questions and share them with Pablo and Vidya. But I believe, um, Pablo, with what you said, speaking about evaluation and then the models that we keep creating, um, I believe this is a great point to, to stop and to wrap up. Um, and we really hope to, to continue our conversation with both of you. And this was just the start, I hope. And thanks for bearing with us as well, because that was the, the very first time that we are using this format. But uh, I want to give a huge, huge thanks to, to Pablo and Vidya for joining us. Um, and I want to add that um, we're organizing this series as part of our 20th anniversary this year. So this is the best way to, um, to honor all the, the teachers and the artists and the educators that we have worked with in the last 20 years. And each month for the series, we'll have another session with uh, artist educators. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And please stay tuned. And lastly, um, I also want to thank the, the AA team who's behind the, this online session, behind their screens. Uh, so thank you, Susanna, Sam, Wendy, Debbie, Paco, and Mark. Um, I will just say, hope to see you all next month, but maybe Pablo and Video, you might have some last words as well. Uh, just to thank you, Oske, and it was really nice meeting everyone and meeting Pablo, whose work on has read and has seen respect for. So thank you, and yeah, I look forward to these sessions continuing, I think, uh, there is a nice way that, and you were also talking about sort of accumulating and looking back over these life lessons uh, and recording different experiences. I look forward to how this session builds up and I'll be tuning in. Indeed. Well, thank you, uh, Bidia, as well, to be in conversation and also for convening this. And um, uh, it's always a pleasure to, to be in conversation with AAA and, uh, and I look forward to uh, the next programs as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Hope to see you very soon.